This is episode 54. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is Enoch Bartlett Sears AIA, and this is the show where we talk about the business side of architecture. Today's show is sponsored by the Business of Architecture Conference, which will be coming to uh, the Internet near you in early October. Today we're joined with, once again, business consultant Mariana Idiarte. She's a strategic business consultant that helps creative industry professionals, including, including architects. So, Mariana, once again, welcome back to the show. Hi, Enoch. Great to be back. Uh, one of my listeners, architect Randy Sovich, asked a question. He said that he recently saw Joshua Prince Ramos, who used to work at, uh, at OMA, uh, speak yes, yeah. and talked about some interesting stipulations in the contract that he uses, basically saying that once the design and the budget is approved by the client, it can't be changed, and that the architect has the right to... Um, to basically, where the, if there's any sort of redesign happening, then the architect has the, the right to a new contract and 100% new fees. Is that something that uh, that he got from uh, the contract that OMA uses? Or is that, <laughs> do you know anything about it? <laughs> uh, no, I, I think that is his own way of putting it, uh, as, as far as I know. I mean, uh -huh. I, I left OMA already uh, five years ago. It may have been a new thing. Uh, well, in fact, what he's saying is, is not, it's not new. Uh, it's actually the case in most standard contracts. It's another, uh, if you want, is, is a lecture that he's giving to most standard classes and contracts. Uh, he's just putting it in a more direct way. Uh, most standard, uh, terms and conditions from, from architectural organizations, uh, say that from the law point of view, they say, you know, the, the architect uh, keeps the rights, uh, the author rights, the intellectual property rights, the copyrights, which implies that, yes, no, no one can change the design without you mm -hmm. uh, approving on that. Uh, that's kind of in, implicit in the law. So I guess what uh, Joshua is doing is just translating it and showing what the implication is. Uh, and this is, again, uh, generalizing because I, I haven't seen, I, I'm just uh, reflecting on what you just mentioned it is. On, uh, but uh, it's, it may be important for his firm to make that very clear. And if that is uh, one of the firm policies that he is very strong about, uh, that's, that's good. Okay. You, you, you talked a little bit about the financial condition of, of these contracts, Mariana. Have you ever been involved in helping architects determine the fees? And if so, do you have any suggestions for you know typical pitfalls to avoid and how they should be thinking about that? Um, well, this is a uh, it is very very broad. Um, Again, this, this varies. I, I, I don't have one single uh, formula that works. Uh, uh, what I think is worth mentioning is that uh, there's always possibilities to consider an alternatives to the way you are building your fees uh, on something that I think I mentioned it even before in our previous talk uh, about putting yourself in the role as a partner of your client rather than the service provider. Um, try again talking about getting to know and understand your client and his motivations. Uh, you may understand how he sees the financials of a project. What is his position? What are his worries? Or what are his resources? And, and you can play along with that. Uh, I've seen cases of people uh, agreeing on working uh, uh, on, on, on the design phases for a rather low fee, but becoming a partner uh, once the houses they designed got sold and being rewarded later on for actually a larger march uh, because they could afford also that waiting until uh, the project was uh, sold and realized. Now, in, under that scenario, there's a lot of risk that the architect's taking on. Of course. Does that 
is there any, um, how do they mitigate that risk? Or is there any upfront, do they charge a higher fee for that initial design concept? You know, how do they mitigate the risk of leaving some of the, the fees until the end of the pro successful project? Well, this particular case I mentioned about, uh, it was a smaller, de a small development. Uh, it was uh, only six villas that were in a, in a, in a premium location. And the architect did a good job in what I mentioned before, doing a, a due diligence in, in checking the solvency and uh, on the reliability of, of, of the client, the developer that wasn't there, that including they are someone who has experience enough on a, a portfolio uh, that is with a marketing uh, um, machinery working properly so that they could feel very comfortable the the villa say this time were going to be sold yeah uh, sold so uh, so that is again that is assessing the risks um, mm -hmm. on seeing how you manage so uh, so they didn't have problems on the client also uh, they asked for an estimation of you know how long does it take until the villas are sold on um, what it, and and they they the did this due diligence into checking what are the, the terms exactly we're talking about. Uh, how long does it take until we actually get paid? Is it until they're built? Or actually, the buyers make a deposit at some point before the villas are built and you're getting paid already from that part, for instance. So there's, uh, again, it's like I said, take your time to uh, to learn about the situation, to understand, to to check on, on, on the financial uh, capabilities or, of your client before you put yourself in a, in a risk position, for sure. Mariana, now one, one of the things that you specialize in is helping architects with international work. And I was just curious, is this something that you think that we should talk about with my audience being primarily, we do have, a, we do have quite a few listeners in the UK, but then also Australia, uh, New Zealand, and the U.S. Great. Uh, I think I think uh, you should uh, for different reasons. Uh, I work a lot, obviously, being in Europe with uh, with European firms, but I do work uh, uh, occasionally as well with uh, with firms outside of Europe, and are those working internationally or wanting to work internationally? Uh, and even if you are not. Uh, considering working internationally is, uh, I think the world is developing in a way that uh, people move around and uh, so are professionals and you are going to be competing probably with foreigner architects going to your country as well, that's happening more and more so it's interesting to know, at least to consider the possibilities or to understand what motivates someone to, to, to go and work somewhere else. So I hope it is of interest for your audience. Absolutely. And, you know, here in the States, the States are so large that they represent, I mean, pretty a similar landmass to uh, the, the to Europe, for instance. And so if, if an architect is even thinking about moving to another state or working in another state, you know, you probably, do you have any good pointers for how to break into a new market when you're the, the new face on the block, people don't know you, how do you penetrate that market? What are some now, strategies uh -oh. for doing that? I'm glad that you made that comparison because indeed uh, when you're in very large countries uh, you don't need to go international to experience uh, the same situation that if you were moving countries and the approach to changing locations of working uh, and the principles of it apply in, in, in any case. Uh, I would say the answer is to tackle uh, that uh, in, an, in a strategic way. And with a strategy, I mean that uh, you have to start asking, uh, you have to follow some steps. And the first one in a, is asking yourself what your motivation is to go and work abroad or in another uh, geography, uh, whether that is uh, purely financial because uh, the area where you are working is in trouble or the market is not moving and therefore you need to find uh, somewhere else, your your commissions, or whether it's a professional motivation, because there are some markets that, because they're in development, may allow you to grow and, and learn as a professional, or just simple personal uh, 
um, motivations uh, because you enjoy a particular culture, you may fall in love with someone else from a different country and want them to move uh, uh, where they live or whatever the motivation is, that, that may determine very much uh, which location you're going to choose uh, to, to move abroad. Uh, that, that is the, the first step. Uh, the second, uh, very important, is on s something that some people don't take uh, in seriously enough or, or with, a, with a delicacy enough, is to spend time and energy in doing proper research. Uh, you know, uh, for instance, uh, um, I don't know about architects in the US, but many architects uh, firms in Europe, small and big, are looking into emerging markets like China or India or Brazil to work in. Um, yes, there are large markets. Yes, there's a lot happening. That doesn't mean that you have sex, uh, successful uh, success guaranteed by going there. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it doesn't mean that you even if you hear negative voices about an experience of people in some markets that you may not succeed because you particularly may have what it takes to to make it uh, your place somewhere else. So um, doing with doing research, I mean into doing a thorough and, and again uh, uh, strategic research on looking into not only uh, whether there's work for architects or not, but looking at the whole socio-economical situation of, of a country or a geography and what, what other things have to do or may affect now in the near future or the longer term uh, the work of architects. Uh, secondly, is uh, getting to know or, or at least uh, question yourself, do you know the culture of that country, or even from one state to the other in the United States or, or regions in large countries enough? Do you know the culture enough? Are you familiar enough or uh, to think that you can be, uh, you can make business there? Uh, that is one of the most underestimated uh, um, matters when it comes to working abroad. Uh, it's like you, you have to deal, I give always the example uh, when uh, you have culture differences within a city, you have culture differences within sectors as well. When moving uh, uh, countries, you have uh, extreme culture differences sometimes. So the, uh, on, on the other hand, there may be cultures in other countries that are closer to what you are familiar with, um, that may be a better match. Uh, for instance, people here in the in the Netherlands, uh, although the culture here is much different for other Northern European countries, the differences are a lot less than with the South of Europe or with South America, for instance, uh, if you compare regions. Uh, so it, there's a lot of uh, things to consider in terms of, of how, how, how much do you know, how much do you know the language, how much do you know about their working culture as well, uh, how flexible you are. Uh, flexibility is another thing that is essential if you are considering working somewhere else. Uh, and flexibility comes into uh, how well you adjust to the local conditions on different ways of working, uh, up to uh, how flexible you are to be uh, having uh, Skype calls at extreme uh, hour differences or catching flights that may get delayed <laughs> and therefore miss a lot of things abroad. So uh, flexibility is another key element. Okay. Uh, Sorry. Yeah, I was just wondering, do you have any tactical examples on a tactical level of things, interesting things you've seen architects doing to break into a market segment? Well, uh, the one tactical element that is uh, it's key to success is building networks, building relevant networks in whatever location you want to work. So uh, if you've done your, your homework and you think, yes, I'm prepared to... Uh, to tackle this, 
uh, you have to start looking into, okay, what people uh, I know there, uh, what organizations, uh, what kind of network do I need to succeed there? And that goes from not only, uh, it's much broader than seeing, oh, who wants to hire me like a client of what markets work for me, but looking into if you're going to work abroad, you most likely need some partners uh, working with the local architect that is familiar with the local regulations, of course, as, as you are not. Uh, uh, working with consultants locally, uh, working, uh, uh, having people in your network that will help you create a reputation that you don't have somewhere else. So it goes to many, many levels or government levels, embassy yeah. levels, etc. And when do you have any examples you can give us of people or, or circumstances you've seen where people have, you know, where do they, when they want to think about start networking, can you give me some tactical examples of how they might approach that? Uh, certainly. Uh, again, this comes to the first point that I mentioned is seeing what your motivation is. Uh, some people have, for, um, in, in most, the easiest way if you have a personal motivation, if something that you want, because maybe you're, you have a background from, or one of your parents or grandparents come from a different country, therefore you have some through the people you know and don't need to per se call potential clients uh, within, within the market. It's, it's start for uh, where, where you feel comfortable with what you, what you know. Uh, if you're going to go into more professional, uh, seek uh, governmental uh, organizations. Uh, many countries have um, from their uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, for instance, they have uh, a agencies or commissions that help uh, entrepreneurs on, on business people working abroad and facilitate uh, their access to some markets. Uh, there are uh, even uh, business uh, um, trips organized uh, by your, uh, government organizations to link and, and network with people. Your uh, architect organization locally may have even a, a chapter or or a department dedicated to that as well. So it, it may vary. Is is again part of the uh, field research? Look at the other architects that are working abroad, and uh, also ask them. Uh, uh, talking to peers is a very useful tool to to learn from each other. Thank you, Mariana. Well, there's just one last question I'd like to ask you because you also mentioned that you you have a, an expertise in helping architects with their presentations and communication and presenting ideas. Could you share with us two or three main, um, you know, the, the advice you would present to architects when they're thinking about communicating who they are, what they represent? Oh, well, um, it's difficult to summarize that in a very single question, but I'll try. Um, I can give you, l let me first finish one, one more thing about the, the working internationally, if you don't mind, Enoch, because one yeah, thing sure. that I wanted to mention very much is that uh, no matter what motivation or what strategy you choose to work internationally, uh, you have to think that it takes a long time before you succeed in the market. Even uh, getting a project, getting a commission, that doesn't mean you have penetrated the market. Uh, so you have to be thinking of a long-term strategy and you have to check whether you have the resources uh, to afford that, uh, to continue working for years and to also on the, if you continue working also in your local region, uh, to have that in mind. That, that is the last thing I wanted to mention about that. Coming back to your question, I will, I will start with a, a, an example of, um, I've been uh, a while ago um, at a session with uh, young architects organized by the, by the Dutch Association of Architects here. And I was invited as, um, to give feedback to young architects uh, about their portfolios. Uh, so there were uh, some senior architects for larger firms, developers, some potential clients, and, and me as, well as an expert to, in a kind of speed date setting, give feedback to, to these young professionals. And 
uh, that was very interesting uh, because I spoke to almost 10 of those uh, young architects. And the moment they came and, and sit in front of me, they just put their portfolios and they start showing me um, all the projects they have done. And I said, but forget your project. Tell me who you are and what are you good at? And why should I hire you and not the architect sitting next to you? And there was a mind-blowing question for absolutely all of them. They were like, oh, I never thought about this. Or, uh, wow, what a difficult question. And, and this is, so that, that is the key for architects to do, again, some homework and, and think about what is your differentiation potential. Uh, what do you have to offer uh, to a potential client or to, to anyone for that matter that the others can't? And what do and you think would be, first... what do you think would be a good or interesting response? I'm just going to flip it around because that's a very good question you made there, Mariana. And I would like to know, you know, give us some ammunition. Tell us what would be a good response to that question. But the good response to this question is is the one that uh, provides a solution for someone's problem. Can you give me uh, a specific example of? Of, oh, of course, uh, for instance, when I, I I talk about myself and my build, business, uh, when someone else so what do you do? I don't say I am a business consultant working for the architecture industry. I said I help architects uh, doing better business. That is uh, that is what I. I, I hope to do at least. So people say, oh, interesting. How do you do that? When you get that response back and therefore a second questions, you know you're in track. Uh, then, so that's, is think again from the perspective from your clients and say, uh, on, on think about what is what you do best that the rest can't. To give you an example of those, um, uh, those young architects I spoke to the day, even even some very young ones, when you start, when I, I took the time, obviously, because it was a, an opportunity to, to coach them and help them uh, develop it, that presentation skills. So I took the time to ask the right questions on, with no exception, after that five minutes to, to talking, we could a, a extract at least one particular thing that they were particularly good at, uh, even the most shy uh, of them, uh, for instance, uh, this was a young architect who uh, extremely shy and, and close person that you would say at first, oh, you're not going to sell your business that easily. But it, what it happens is that this, um, this young man, uh, he has in his uh, family history a lot of people with a, uh, who need special um, uh, attention for, for uh, some disabilities or special health care. So he's very familiar with uh, the needs of, of people that uh, for health reasons need that special care. Um, he's, he knows very well their, uh, what they need in a, in a living or working environment. So he knows also the health system. He knows the people working there. And, and, and that is something where he, he was considering working for in, in that sector, helping in, in health and on, on renovating houses for people with, that need special care. And, and that just much perfect with his, histor his story and even his personality, not being maybe a too commercial or outspoken person, but someone who understand and have the empathy be with, with people uh, within the health system because he knows it very well from inside. And that is what he can, that many architects want to be able to to provide, for instance. Excellent. Well, I'd like to give some homework to our listeners, Mariana, and I'd like them to answer that question for themselves. Take a minute, think about what is it that you do that's different than everyone else? What do you bring to the table that's unique? And then go to the show notes of this particular episode and put that into the comments. Mariana, how about that? And then we, you and I can win touch bases right. later and then take a look at those um, just through email or whatever and, and maybe give some feedback on those comments. Sounds great. All right. Well, Mariana, I know that you, you have to run because you do have a, an appointment to run to, and our previous episode went a little bit over, but thank you for joining us. Did you have any other thoughts that you wanted to leave us with on, on communication or anything else we talked about today? Well, communication is definitely a very, very broad subject on uh, uh, something else that when, I, when I, I, I teach students as well is one of the most difficult to, things to bring across 
are uh, uh, that of how to phrase your your specialty or do your differentiation, uh, not only from the thinking point of view, but I I, I always give the example take Google uh, architects uh, on on avoid using uh, standard words. Uh, I, I I always put look up for the young and dynamic uh, architecture office, and you get like millions of hits. And, and they are the same. And it's like, what, is, what does actually mean young and dynamic? Uh, whatever you uh, you want to use to describe your firm or describe yourself as an architect, make sure that it makes sense, that it means something. If you say, um, I'm a very experienced architect, uh, show it, say, because I work in more than 100 projects. Or you have to uh, to prove what you state. That is, that's a stake I use all very, it doesn't, you don't need to win the Pulitzer Prize for uh, great writing. It's, it's about being, using the right language, straight and clear, and someone that your clients will understand. Excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, I appreciate that. A great point, Mariana. And I, once again, I encourage everyone to listen to this episode, you know, wherever you're at, whether you're working out, driving in the car, or working on some drawings right now. You know, when you get the chance, go to businessofarchitecture.com, look up. This is the second episode with, with Mariana Idiarte, and put in there your differentiator, what you think your differentiator is, and we look forward to seeing that. Well, Mariana, thank you once again for joining us, and have, have a good evening. You're welcome, Ina. It was great to talk to you again. You too. And that's a wrap. Thanks for riding along on another show about the business of architecture. I want to know your opinion about today's episode. Visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash podcast or send me an email at show at businessofarchitecture.com with your feedback about today's show. And remember, visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash free to grab your free membership pass to Business of Architecture Insider, where you'll have first access to free resources to help you run a great business. See you next week. views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you run a great business. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5. Do it anyway.